Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Tony Rouser. I'm the AR director for ESP Guitars. I want to thank Pipple Audio for having us here tonight. We're very excited to be here. If you guys have any questions about ESP, please come see me after the clinic. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. And without further ado, please give a warm welcome to George Lynch. All right, thank you.
why am I out of breath? That's weird. <laughs> Just playing guitar. But playing guitar is hard, right? No, no, no. But it's actually, it's actually a workout. It's actually burn a lot of calories because um, thinking uses a lot of calories. And your brain uses up like half the calories that you use. So when you're playing, most guitar players think a lot. I don't, which is why I'm not losing weight right now. But yeah. Um, now I just play sort of uh, just off the top of my head. I'm not a a um, you know I don't know theory. I'm not a trained, schooled musician, so to speak. I'm just sort of self-taught, and I have my own sort of theory about intervals and the fretboard, and that's basically. It. And I just sort of play from uh, the head and the heart, mostly heart. Because uh, when I start thinking, I start screwing up a lot. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but on that song I just played to right now, I was a half step out of key for the first half of the song. <laughs> right. So you thought, this guy's either an idiot or he's a genius. <laughs> right. uh, the stuff I was playing to is, um, this is all brand new for me. I just got this, uh, this laptop last night, and I installed this program, which is... Um, Neural DSP, which has become highly recommended by this gentleman named Tosin Abasi, who hooked me up, and uh, so I'm very, uh, very excited about using this. So I was, I was up there early this morning. I was been playing with it, and I just got the interface as well, the Apollo Arrow, which is wonderful, and I'm having fun with it. I thought, you know, what? I'm going to try this. You know, try to fit into the brave new world, being an old guy, old school guy, old tubes and everything. And I'm not really a technology guy. I'm not good with this stuff, but um. You guys help me out. I appreciate that, the people that work here. And uh, so I'm trying this out. This DSP is uh, it's called Archetype Abasi uh, is the program, I guess you would call it. Um, and I'm playing along to this material I'm working with. It's a, it's a record that I've been working on for a few months called Gen Rev. Uh, it's to uh, Tony Franklin on bass, uh, Brian Titchy on drums, and um, a mystery singer that I can't name, but um, anyways, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, this is just stuff that we're working on, this is not finished or anything. As you notice, there was already, there was already a solo on it, I forgot that, so I'm playing along to my own solo. But that's all right, right? I'm just winging it here. So um, yeah, I'm gonna play along to a couple more tracks. And then we can, if anybody has any questions, and don't necessarily have to be about me, we can stop talking about me and talk about music in general or anything you want to talk about. And then I'm going to fire it back up uh, with, I think we have a bass player and a drummer, right? Set up to jam? Bam. So we have, I don't, we don't know each other, right? Have we ever met before? Nope. I've never, have we ever met before, sir? And you're, nope. We haven't talked on the phone. We have. We don't have a plan. We don't have a set list. We don't even know if we're tuned in the same key. Right? No, I'm not kidding. We're just gonna wing it. So that could be good or bad. So we'll do that for a second, and um, maybe signing. We're doing signing. So we probably brought some eight by tens and all that kind of good stuff, ESP stuff. Um, Okay, okay, great. And we could sign guitars, sign, so I sign everything but body parts. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we just realized backstage that this is the 45th anniversary of ESP, which is pretty amazing. I, I've been with them. <laughs> um, we're trying to figure it out. I think uh, 87, so it'd be like maybe 33 years-ish. Yeah. After the first 25, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. But yeah, no, it's an, I'm honored to be representing USP and be part of the family. It's really been an incredible um, journey, quite honestly. And to have something consistent in your life for that long, which is a rare thing, right? Well, we've been around a while. I've come to realize that you know, a lot of things come and go. But ESP remains forever. Yeah, no. Well, I don't know about that. But. Anyways, um, I'm going to keep going here. So. Um, We'll talk again in a little bit, all right?
guitar up.
This is a project called Stone House. It's that really, anything that was really commercially yeah. done, uh, we can put it out by myself. It's just a, a love project. And I had a, a property called Stone House in Northern California, it's up in the mountains. Hand built place. Uh, it was the Stone House on top of the, uh, the, the mountain. And it was, uh, I converted this uh, barn built in the 40s, all built by hand out of redwood and stone. And uh, converted into the studio. My brother and I spent about a year building the studio. And then uh, I got together with uh, Matt from Saigon King and another gentleman programmer. And um, we hold up, uh, held ourselves up in the, in the barn for, you know, I don't know, a month or so. We came up with all this stuff. It ended up being an EP, I think, or something. But I just really love it. And uh, it's just not, you know, your typical uh, heavy rock stuff necessarily. But that's what I love about it. Uh, this is, I just like the last thing I'll play here. This is called uh, Deep in the Room. Again, I gotta, I gotta find the keys. So give me a second. <laughs>
success. Uh, thank you, guys. So, all right. Well, I guess we're done with the laptop, Mr. Ryan. Uh, let me take a drink of water here to just get my breath. And if you guys want to ask any questions or discuss anything, that's what I'm here for. And then we'll get back to music and do some signing. Does this sound cool? Yeah. yeah. Hey, when Ace Freely quit Kiss, and then when Jenny Vincent got fired, were you ever asked to audition for Kiss? I've never been asked to join any band ever in my life. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Not even I've been waiting. I've been like... My wife's like, honey, what's wrong? Why do you keep staring at the phone? Why are you crying? And it's like, Judas Priest's not calling. White Snake's not calling. No, nope. Dawkins not calling. Nobody's calling. <laughs> no, I, the, the thing is, is that I, I think I have a very kind of sort of just, I'm kind of my own player, you know? I'm not really good at fitting in in, uh, in other situations. Not personally, but just, um, I've never been in a cover band, so I don't know very many cover songs, you know, I, I'm not good at picking up stuff and uh, fitting into other boxes. I've always created my own box, you know, since I was a kid, little kid, I was just always, I've heard this stuff in my head and I keep following it, you know what I mean? I keep chasing that dragon until I catch it by the tail one day, which will never happen, of course, thank God, but uh, I love it, but I sort of, you know, just keep, you know, trying to create my, it's not, I'm saying my world, but the thing that I hear which is not White Snake, and it's not Judas Priest or anything like that. You know, it's kind of a kiss. Oof. Hey, you know, as we get older, we're all like kind of, kind of just you know, take one for the team. Sure, I'll take the kiss gig for a million dollars a week. You know what? But uh, who knows? No, but nobody's been calling. You know. Oh, new Lynch Mob. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Actually, it went a little different this time. Got a whole new band next year. Uh, we're doing a whole bunch of shows with, uh, with Dokken next year. So us opening up, yeah, it'll be super fun. Oh, uh, so, you know, the little bit of competitiveness there, there's a that rivalry, which I think is good. Because, you know, at the uh, end of the day, we're entertainers, and we're there to, you know, we'd create an event, something worth, you know, spectator sport. So a little, little bit of that uh, competition, I think, is very, very healthy. But, you know, we all love each other, and we'll just go out there, and, and we'll kick ass. We'll try to kick their ass, and they'll try to kick our ass, and that makes for a good show. And then I come in out at the end, and me and Doc, Don um, kiss and hug and make up, and we, I do four songs with Dokken. Yeah, it says... Um, Are you guys from San Diego? Uh, at this moment, we don't have a gig in San Diego yet, no. Uh, we have a Costa Mesa gig at the, at the amphitheater. Um, but I was going to answer your question, which was the singer on the new Lynch Mob record... Um, hold on a second, let me get uh, to back up, uh, Lynch Mob has evolved into quite a revolving door band and I've just learned to accept that, stop trying to fight the inevitable. Uh, it's never going to be that band of brothers where it's just the four guys forever like Zeppelin that you grow to love and each personality like the Beatles, you know, it's not going to be that, it's just, we're all, but everybody that comes through the doors and in and out the door, we're, we're friends and, and you know, um, uh, all have respect for each other. And there's been very few ugly departures from the band. So um, as of this moment, the band is Brian Titchy again um, on drums. And um, uh, Michael Devon is going to be playing some of the shows, the bass player from Whitesnake, who was in Lynch Mob at one point. And then also, and I know this is confusing, Tony Franklin maybe playing some shows and then as far as the singer joe retta is singing on the new album and i think you're going to be really you're going to love it it's, i mean he is he is that bluesy guy that's just you know al green aretha franklin paul rogers you know but in the context of our music you know it's just and the record itself is very Interesting and strange in a, in a great way. I think it's it's definitely out of the box for Lynch Mob. Anyways, I mean it, it goes even goes down a Mr. Bungle Road for a second. So that's how out of the box it is, but in a good way. In a good, I don't want to scare you. Uh, as far as uh, uh, on tour, um, Oni is going to be singing. Yeah, the original singer. But that could change tomorrow. You know. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. Oh, thank you, sir. What's this pill in, that she put in here? It says, Roofie? Hey, Jeff, 
George, uh, quick, I got a statement and then a question. And the statement is... Uh, oh, you said a statement, you worried me. I thought you meant like a bill. Right. <laughs> no, no. Like it's an invoice. Like, you know, when people, like, it seems like when George Lynch comes up, you get thrown in, you know, to the school of shredders, which, of course, you belong there. But, but I do want to say, I think a lot of times something that's overlooked is that you're a great songwriter. You know, um, I happen to think that you're a great songwriter. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I, I was, I've been listening to the first couple Lynch Mob albums in my car over the last couple months, and I just, I, I, it doesn't get talked about enough, you know, that the work that you put into arrange great music and great songs and chords, besides just being like the shred guy. You, you know? know, but, you know, um, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the compliment. But if I was really a, a really good songwriter, I'd only have to write one song. <laughs> But instead, I've had to write like 600 fucking songs. <laughs> Still not fucking Hey Jude yet. The question was, um, I hey Dude. <laughs> you saw that movie, right? No, no, no I haven't. What was that movie? Yesterday. 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 Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I just wonder if you could expand a little bit on uh, like your preference and your interest in the wider next. Like, I know you were a pioneer of the hot rod guitars in the late 70s. I haven't been a pioneer. I'm just yeah. ripping off shit from other people. <laughs> <laughs> Song-wise, guitar-wise, everything-wise. But thank you again for the compliment. But no, I I'm, I'm really haven't come up with anything original. Um, there was this one thing, but I can't remember what it was. But other than that, um, just, you know, but that's human nature is just built on the shoulders of our predecessors, you know, and that's what we're designed to do, and that's what makes us collectively powerful is that we need each other, you know? We, nobody does it alone. I don't care what anybody says. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. You know, we all need each other. I'm a firm believer in altruism and empathy, and I believe that um, I'm just part of the process. And I'm not trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to exercise false humility here. Well, maybe I am a little bit, but, because I am fucking awesome. <laughs> no, but anyways, I'm just kidding. I know, I'm confused, and I'm not sure what I think about myself. But enough about me. What do you think of my last album? I'm just kidding. No, no. I'm just wondering, like, what got you interested in Wider Necks? Like, the, the Wider Nut With? And uh, the, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, the, and, like, the flatter radius, was it just easier to uh, play? That or? was the Sherbell thing, okay. you know? I mean, I used to go up, you know, back in the day when I was teaching at road school and, and all that and stuff and building, sort of, not really building guitars, but sort of bolting stuff together um, and selling to my students. I had students at a little record store called Best best records in Cerritos, and then I taught up at Musonia as well. And um, I had a 72 Oldsmobile and lived in an apartment with my wife and two kids in Anaheim. And we were pretty much broke all the time. So Mrs. Rhodes is paying me $10 an hour. Well, it took me $10 in gas, you know, just to get up there. So I had to um, supplement my, my income. So I would put these guitars together. So I'd go up to Charvel, and I'd go to San Dimas, and I'd go to Mighty Mike, me and my buddy, and we'd buy bodies and necks and parts, and we'd paint them and bolt them together and wire them up, and I'd sell them to my students. Um, but what happened one day was I was in class in Musonia, and I had a couple of students. I was delivering guitars, and money was being exchanged, a big wad of cash, and I was handing over a guitar. And right at that moment, Mrs. Rhodes kicked in the door and it's like, we need to talk. Because I was doing business in her, in, in Musonia, which was not ethical, I guess. So she wanted a piece of the action, and then she fired me. <laughs> yeah, that's my Musonia story. Okay. Yeah. You wanted something more uplifting, I'm sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I'd go up to Charvel, and I'd, I'd spend um, the night up there with Grover and his wife, and we'd hang out, have dinner, and then we'd just be in the wood shop all day. And what I would do is I'd just pick out stuff that was in the wood pile, because they'd have, you know, they'd have blams or, you know, seconds or whatever, make mistakes, and they would throw it out, but they'd cut it in half first, so nobody else could use it. So anything that was usable, I'd pick it up, it'd be like 20 bucks. So the Tiger, for instance, the Tiger guitar, was a $20 body. Heavy Northern Ash, took it home, me and my friend Irv Veach painted it, nitrocellulose lacquer, slapped a neck on it, slapped a bunch of parts. The guitar cost me under $100. I just sold that guitar for 125,000. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to build you a guitar. <laughs> I thought about it. 
Do you still prefer the wider necks? On yeah, the but I could play anything. I, I mean, I have a Linhoff Tele that I love. I've got, you know, various ESPs that have all different neck dimensions. Uh, Les Pauls, I mean, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's a good neck, good at what it does, you know, if it's high radius and, you know, it, it doesn't matter as long as it's, it's, it's set up right and it's built well, you know. It um, doesn't matter. You just, it makes you play a little different, you know, obviously. I'm Big Frog from the Metal Shop Podcast. I'm a big fan. Oh. Um, we were supposed to do an interview, but you didn't show up. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Somebody said you went and got something to eat. <laughs> so, uh, I drove four and a half hours to be here to be with... And I didn't eat, because I didn't want to be late. Like, goes, where's Pedal Mod... Pod, what is it? Podcast? Metal? Yeah. Oh. Just, just to save them, that's the different interviewer. I know, I was just kidding. I don't even know who you are. Dude. <laughs> so, since the 80s, since I was working in guitar shops, people have been after that George Lynch sound. Who? George, everyone. George Lynch? Yeah. Oh, indeed, Warren. So my, Warren D. Martinez. This sounds better. Oh, are you now just... Happy being the owner of that George Lynch sound, or are you still looking for something that eludes you? Mm, it's not, neither one, actually. It's more like, um, it's it's not like I'm married to any sound or think there's a George Lynch sound. I just keep chasing the sound that I'm trying to achieve, right? right? And it's elusive. But the thing is, I keep, that's why I'm, I'm a gear freaking monster. I mean, I just... That's my whole, I'm so passionate about gear. Just, that's when I go on the road every day, I go to little music stores, and that's all I think about when I look online, and it's just like, that's all me and my friends talk about. I'm just a gear animal because it's the machine that translates what's in here to, you know, out here. So it's so important, you know, and I'm so dependent, tone dependent. I'm not like a lot of players that can just play on anything. I mean, I guess I could a little bit, but very tone dependent, so. It's just I love the quest. I don't love the destination as much as the quest, you know. Because, you know, it's just crazy because there's, you know, what's better than Band of Gypsies? How can we ever get better than Hotel California or Stairway to Heaven or anything? You know, uh, you can't beat that, you know, and we, should, we shouldn't even try, I guess, you know. I don't even know what I'm doing, actually. You know what? I quit. I'm going to get a real job. They said you had the Aussie gig twice. No. 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 I was I was I was in it for like a second kind of. Like I traveled to Europe with them and rehearsed with them in Texas and stuff like that, but they didn't really like me, I don't think, because I had short hair. Right. And uh, Ozzy's wife didn't like my guitar because it was green and she thought it looked like a booger. Yeah. Was, Why is your guitar green? Why'd you cut your hair? But Ozzy was bald. And I can get a different guitar. <laughs> Whatever. What? If you, I'll tell you what, though. You know what they were going to pay me for that gig? $250 a week. Uh, oh, <laughs> but I'm sure by now I'd be making like $325. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you get Ozzy. Docking rules, dude. Eh. You know, who knows? That's one of those uh, uh, butterfly effect moments, you know. Had I turned left or right, everything would have been different. I'm happy right now, so maybe I wouldn't have been happy. Maybe a lot of things could have happened. I don't know. Right. We never know, right? No way to find out. Was your main delay in the docking day the Lexicon PCM 41? Is there what? Your main delay in the docking days? Oh, yeah, I used the 41 a lot, but I was not a fan of it. I just was, I never went or got around to getting a 42, which is what Warren uses, that's why he has a better sound than me. <laughs> 42 is a lot richer, it has that rich lexicon, whatever is that algorithm on that chip, which is very proprietary to lexicon. And I still use the lexicon stuff in the studio, that's my favorite stuff. I do like these SD3000s as well, those are my kind of second favorite. The lexicons are very hard to use, you know, they're, they're tricky. Um, yeah, they got, they got just a very majestic, low-mid kind of depth tune that I love. It's very musical and not tinny at all. But um, I like these SD3000s. I'm going to plug through these in a second here when we get the band up here and fire it up. Yep. I noticed uh, in a lot of your music that a lot of the uh, 
the lyrics and, and songs are geared towards like enlightenment and into a higher connection, and it's almost subliminally or elusively, and uh, unless I'm just strange and that's what I'm pulling out of it, but I find it all over in your music in a lot of things, especially like on, on Lynch Pilsen and even some of like uh, of um, Souls of Weed, but it's all over, and, and with um, Ultraphonics as well, that was definitely geared towards enlightenment and stuff like that, and I'm just wondering if that, because I, I, to me, I started noticing that come in actually in Dysfunctional and even in uh, Sisigi, but was it, was there a triggering moment to where you started going after well, I gotta. Uh, I'm not talking about God per se. I'm just talking about our quantum connection. Well, I mean, I don't know if this is. I'm not saying this isn't the venue to talk about um, quantum mechanics and spirituality and philosophy. But I am an animal. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a. You know, I'm very interested in. In you know, I read voraciously and um, study. You know, different philosophies and science as as, as a layman. Um, don't know anything. But I'm, you know, on that eternal, interesting search, it's just fascinating to me. You know, I love it. Um, the interconnectedness of everything. One of my favorite books of all time is Esther Godel uh, Bach by Hofstetter. It's a Pulitzer Prize-winning book written in the 90s, and it's a fascinating uh, connection between mathematics and recursiveness. Basically, um, you know, pi. Uh, you know, the, the golden ratio, the number that binds the universe, including music, frequencies together. And, uh, you know, that's your intelligent design. <laughs> no creator needed. Whoa. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I do think about things sometimes. What's your favorite solo to play? Oh, um, you know, I don't play any of my solos verbatim. So I'm still creating on stage. You know what I mean? So I'm still... Um, when I play solos in the studio, I'm just making shit up. I don't have anything planned, except for one solo, which is Tooth and Nail. It was the only one I had pre-planned, which is the best solo I ever recorded, so I should probably do more of that. But everything else is spontaneous, meaning I, I compose it in the studio. So when I play live, I don't recreate. Um, the audience doesn't experience the recreative moment. They're experiencing the creative moment. So I'm like on a high wire act. I'm like the Flying Walendas without a net. So... I may fall off and, you know, train wreck or go to higher ground. I don't know. I don't know. They don't know. And I, I, I like that. You know, I love that because it's, it's immediate. So, you know, um, there's only two days in the year that we can't change, yesterday and tomorrow. So I try to live in the moment. And especially musically, I've learned that lesson to get out of my own way is just to trust the universe and let it flow through me, you know, not to sound too new age or anything weird, but whatever that is, I don't know how to put a name on it, but, but if I try to t think for myself sometimes, I play like shit, and then if I just relax and breathe, I play better, you know. So that's, for me, that's what, I mean, it's a pretty dumb, simple lesson, but it was a hard lesson to learn, quite honestly. What are some of your 70s influences? Oh. Late 60s uh, up until mid-late 70s is my era, you know, my golden, was, to me it was the golden age of music for guitar players because I grew up uh, with, uh, well, my father um, uh, would have me listen to uh, jazz music and flamenco music, and that's what I sort of, you know, learned Malaguena and Charlie Bird and stuff like that. Not verbatim necessarily too much, but playing along with it and so forth. And then the Beatles came along you know, I listened to a lot of R&B before that, soul music and things like that. And then, uh, uh, then uh, Beatles came along, and that captured the whole universe, of course, for a while. And then, of course, the British invasion with the Four Horsemen, Clapton, Beck, uh, Hendrix, and Page. I mean, that was it. And to be raised at that point in time, and to be a guitar player and a kid playing in your garage band, and that's your first record you bu you're buying, yeah. is like Zeppelin One. I'm really, really lucky, because the rest of you motherfuckers just like heard about it, but I was there. Yeah, I can remember sitting in my drummer, our drummer I played with, Steve Moore's bedroom. I lived with him and for a while, and we practiced in his garage, and he had our little turntable, and we dropped that needle, and whoa, oh my God, we, we got to go in the garage and try to be that. You know what I'm saying? Come on, but dude, so many bands. I mean. I tell you, like I'll pick out some random ones. Well, Chris, there's all the, the the ones that you know about, but uh, 
focus, for instance. Now that's that's kind of an obscure one, but uh, uh, Hocus Pocus or the, what was that song? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ackerman was the guitar player. He was the first prog guy that I heard way before well before Holdsworth. In Temp- Holdsworth was in a band called Tempest, which I was into him as well. So, I mean, there's so much stuff, dude. I don't know. Bebop Deluxe, um, Spooky Tooth, uh, Mountain, of course, was a huge influence. Johnny Winter. Um, I mean, I don't know. I could go down the list. We'd be here for a million years. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Chambers Brothers. I listened to Time, and I wore that record out and jammed along to that thing. Because my, my rehearsal, my practice thing that I had at home was my dad had a big GE stereo. And I would put the records on, and then I would plug my guitar into the input section of the tape machine, which would distort and come through. And I'd play along with it and watch myself in the mirror and think I was a rock star. And I'd go, oh, yeah, I'm playing. Yeah. And everybody would make fun of me. What, do you think you're going to be a rock star? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Mahogany Rush. I went and saw Mahogany Rush with Queen at Winterland uh, in 1975, Sheer Heart Attack Tour. I talked to Frank some years ago, five years ago or so. He was up in Montreal. And I asked him about that show. I could tell he was not happy. He goes, he hated that tour. And he's a monster, right? Uh, That's Zach's whole inspiration, is Frank. One of his main ones. And... uh, Queen, oh Jesus! Talk about an influence, right? Yeah, Brian May. Easy top. Well, let me ask. Yes, sir. Okay, you definitely have a signature sound, and and when you're doing Thank your you. your solos and the, you just do so many great things, but is there certain things that you consider signature, like signature licks? You know, yeah. I do all like this, yeah. and I'm gonna take this and put it here later or stuff, yeah. or you just, when you're playing off the top of your head, live, you just do it? Uh, I don't, yeah, no, I, I could never play anything twice, and I don't have any actual licks, licks, you know, like most guys sit around and go, oh, I can do this, or I can do that. No, I just, <laughs> it's just all like, like snowflakes, you know, you, they're there, and then they melt, and they go away, and you have to rediscover them. That's why, I kind of, I feel a little bit, uh, st- it's kind of a stressful thing, a little bit. Not a bad stress, but every time I play, it's a new, fresh experience, and I don't really have those licks to back, to um, fall back on. So everything is a new thing, you know. Every time I stay, whether it's here, or a live show, or a record, or whatever, I have to recreate myself, you know. Or just, or just let it flow, yeah. But I got a couple, you know, I have some things that I do over and over again, of course, but just by muscle memory and default, you know, I do the horizontal vibrato, you know, that's, I did that when I was a kid because I didn't know how to go like that, it hurt. So instead of doing that, I just went like that. And that's how I learned that, you know, just accident, happy accident. You're right. Question. I noticed that when I play, I play better depending on what I eat. Do you have a favorite food that you eat before? <laughs> I eat raw protein. I eat raw meat and red wine, preferably cheap red wine. Do you have a secret ingredient for tread? <laughs> oh, shoot, dude. I never got it. That's a fucking crazy question. I don't even know how to absorb that question. I'm going to be thinking about that one all the way home, all four hours of the way home. No, uh, well, not really. You know, I eat healthy, so I'm, I'm like kind of, you know, vegan, that sort of thing. Um, but I haven't always been healthy. Uh, and I used to have these episodes on stage where I would pass out. And I found it was from eating too close to performance. Because as I said, I get wound up when I play. I get really, you know, I have to learn to breathe. And I, I got to wear loose clothing and stuff like that. And uh, you get under the hot lights. Back then, they had the pars, you know. It's like you're a French fry, you know. And I'd wear these rubber suits and shit. You know, I mean, it'd be like. So I'd pass out. I passed out probably like 10 times, even in Dock. And, and I have to go to the hospital and stuff like that. And they said it was don't eat three hours before you play. So. Not having much in your stomach, I think, is, is what I pretty much don't do anymore at all. I don't eat anything heavy uh, any time close to a show. You know, because I think, when you think about it, um, primitive humans 
uh, needed to have, their senses had to be sharp to survive when they were hungry. They had to succeed at killing something or finding something, so their eyesight, their sense of smell and hearing and so forth had to be acute. And so hunger does that. When you're hungry, your senses are actually less lethargic and more acute and more, um, you know, they're more finely tuned so that you can succeed at hunting and surviving, right? So I think the sa it's the same for your playing. You know, if you're light, you're a little, you know, light on your feet and you're kind of listening and you're reacting quicker, I think that's good for everything, you know, including playing. So there's that. Well, no, you don't want to not eat at all because then you're all fucking nervous and weak and shit. Yeah, but. Huh? Just not before playing. Yeah, three hours. Three hours is, yeah, two and a half hours. I just had a big vegan burrito right before I walked out here, but whatever. <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, what inspired you or how did you come about writing without warning? Uh, without warning, uh, well, first of all, the name I found in TV Guide. Remember TV Guide? Yeah. So I would get a lot of the titles from Dawkins songs. If you look at about half those titles, <laughs> they're a movie in TV Guide. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that was a ripoff of something that Randy Rhodes did in Ozzy, I think. And I can't remember the song. One of his famous songs. It was just kind of my version of it. Yeah. Everything I've ever written has been plagiarized from somebody else. <laughs> Huh? Did you ever get to jam with Ernie? Yeah, we played shows together and uh, we jammed at the at Musonia sometimes. Yeah. So to tag on to that uh, question about uh, your influences in the 70s, what did you like coming out of the 80s? Mm. <laughs> I mean, you're going to get mad at me if I tell you what I liked in the 80s. No, seriously, I, I should probably keep it to myself. Uh, yeah, so people are like, what? We like you like you are. Disco. No. I didn't like, well, well, you know, honestly, now, Bee Gees are amazing. Yeah, of course. I mean, there's nothing wrong with some, getting me some Bee Gees. Hey, George, in your A day, who was one of your favorite bands what? that you played with that you admired and got to hang out with? I was like, awesome. What heyday? You mean 80s? Any <laughs> Oh, docking days. Um, hang out with? Uh, I get to hang out with Eddie Van Halen in his hotel room for uh, on the Monsters of Rock tour a lot. Yeah. We, we became kind of buds. Not anything I talk about. <laughs> so it's not an era that I look back on fondly, to be quite honest with you. But I really liked Rat. Of all those bands, I thought Rat was, I enjoyed listening to. Yeah, I love Rat. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a lot of, like, I mean, Priest was like, I still to this day love Priest and wish they would call me up and hire me. <laughs> you and Warren Glenn Tipton, hello. Huh? You and Warren still stay in touch and hang out? Yeah, a little bit, you know. He came to a show uh, a few months back. Hung out. Yeah. You guys got a lot of questions. This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> see, like ten questions. <laughs> There's like an industry kind of standard where they say like a record's never done. You like run out of time essentially. Yeah. What What is it for you? What puts that stamp of approval of like you know what I can accept this as it is? Well, yeah, no, it's really. Uh, I had the opposite view these days because I've been down that road with the Never Ending album with the that ends up costing you know. More, every single nickel that you have, right, and uh, takes a year or whatever, six months or a year and a half. I've done those records, and it's completely wasteful, I think, to the point of being immoral. You know what I'm saying? So, in other words, your family and your friend's family and your band members' families have to go without money and their time and their attention because you're so selfish to feel that you have to be that self-indulgent. In other words, if you can't go in and... How long did it take the Beatles or Zeppelin to write and record their records? Days, weeks. And those are pretty good records. <laughs> On the ones that took you the longest, did you feel the happiest with them? There's only one record I spent a whole bunch of money on and a whole lot of time that I felt was justifiable, and that was Wicked Sensation. Yeah. And that was $550,000 and a year plus. But we were firing on all cylinders and we knew what we wanted and we had to get it right and we did but um, nowadays I am I have a lot of 
I pride myself in being very efficient with my time, and I enjoy it. Because, you know, I don't labor over something. I just knock it out. I have high standards. I think, I, you know, I know when it's good. I, I don't allow crap through, I don't think. But um, play with really good people, get good sounds, have good stuff to start with. That's the thing. I mean, I think I'm getting better sounds now and writing better. No, I don't want to say that. But I'm writing and enjoying what I'm writing and, and enjoying what I'm playing for one, you know, two hundredth of the cost. <laughs> You know, I'll do, I'll do a record and I get hired to do records. I'll do records in 10 days. <laughs> Tooth and nail, I don't remember. That was a long time ago. That was a few lifetimes ago. What's your favorite song off Tooth and Nail? Uh, what? Besides Tooth and Nail. I don't know. I don't even know what songs are on that record. It's so <laughs> weird when people talk about old records. Like, it's not like I sit around and listen to them, you know what I mean? I don't My favorite song is when Heaven Comes Down. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was a good song. <laughs> what is a piece of advice you have for the younger guitar players of this generation? Um, I'd say the, my one standard default piece of advice for people that really served me very, very well um, from the 90s on when guitar music, when you were embarrassed to admit you were a guitar player. It was like you would purposely play really short one-note solos in the middle of songs because it was like, you know, shredding was like an embarrassing thing to do, right? Um, and uh, music, guitar, like my genre of guitar music was in, you know, was, um, had regressed to the point where it was um, hard to find work. So um, I diversified, started building guitars, uh, working with other endorsers to develop products and market products and promote them. Um, getting involved in all facets of my business um, you know, whether I had a nat natural inclination for it or not, you know, developing a website, um, you know, uh, just doing everything I could, playing uh, for other people, writing songs for other people, um, just diversifying, you know, because it's just like investing, you know, um, you just kind of, you spread the risk over a larger area. So if one thing kind of declines, let's say record sales decline, you can still do touring, you still have your endorsers and you still have something else, you know, your outside work, let's say. So it kind of evens out the bumps and the peaks and the valleys a little bit in your life. So your financial life isn't so much of this. And uh, you have more options, you know. I think it's just common sense. Why did the Monsters of Rock thing get cut short? The, the tour or the you mean the the new one, the cruise? Part of it, the, the American tour. I, it, it, it didn't go all over the place, right? Uh, we did thirty-two, like thirty-something shows. I don't uh, remember. Like, I Don was, it was good. It didn't come to Southern California. I don't think. Yeah, we played the Coliseum. L.A. LA. <coughs> Pretty big place. <laughs> the Romans were there. Yeah, back in the day. Just that one time, right? That one tour. Oh, yeah, we just did the, the first one with Metallica. George, can I hear that ESP with your 13K pickup into that Park 45 through that Phase 90 <laughs> Tube Screamer Klon, two SD3 3000s, and a GP16? I'm not sure. I can't see that. I want to hear you play it. Dude, you're so demanding, dude. You know exactly what you want. I love it. Thank you. All right, guys. We're going to jam. Is there a brass block on that guitar? Huh? 15 minutes. 15 minutes of jamming. Okay, here we go. Many questions, but thank you guys for asking all this. Very interesting. I wish next time we'll talk about you. All right. Is there a rock clock on that guitar? Is there a what? Is there a clock on that guitar? Oh, I need to put one on there. I don't put any of the good. I keep forgetting to. Uh, there's so much stuff I want to try on my own guitars. Um, I want to try something with still frets, which I have tried. I've played, played with them, but I haven't put any on my own guitars. Uh, but I do love them. They feel great. And, uh, yeah, and I'm a big fan of the stone tongue blocks and the brass blocks. Okay, um, are we going to get a bass player and a drummer? Yeah, here we go. Bass player and drummer? Oh, bass player. No. Uh, your drummer? Are you done now? No, the drummer's right here. Oh, well. Let me see. Yeah. Drummer? Yeah. The actual drummer? Yeah, that's the actual drummer. <laughs> we have the bass player in the building. He's made, there he is. Come up all right. We're right there. Get out there. <laughs> <laughs>
It's like going back into the garage days, you know, it's never changed. Improvising in the moment, not yesterday, not tomorrow. And that was a little bit of, little bit of Hendrix channeling there. Thank you very much, guys. So we are going to be doing a signing. So if you guys could all calmly line up by the door, I believe there's a table over there where we'll be doing a signing in just a few minutes. 